Hello, I'm Locke Meredith. Please join me on the next Legal Lines. I'm going to have on the show Dr. Daryl Peterson. He's an orthopedic surgeon here in Baton Rouge. Also served in the military, graduated from West Point. He's going to talk to us about being an orthopedic surgeon and how health insurance has affected the practice of medicine along with workers' comp and many other numerous items. So join us on the next Legal Lines with Dr. Daryl Peterson. Cox Communications is homegrown with local programming for you. Whether it's local sports, local arts and education, local news and weather, local faith and worship, or local stations with the best in entertainment. Cox Communications brings it all home to you. It's homegrown programming with roots. Only on cable. Only on Cox. Welcome to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith, and I'm very pleased to have on the show Dr. Daryl Peterson. He's an orthopedic physician here in town. Daryl, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having us, Locke. Uh, tell the folks a little bit about yourself so they know why they should listen right, to you. Right. I'm uh, Daryl Wayne Peterson. I'm a, a native of uh, Hammond, Louisiana. So from Baton Rouge, and, uh, and, Louisiana area. Right, Perry. and, uh, and uh, attended uh, college after finishing Hammond High School in the late 70s at the United States Military Academy at West Point. After that, went on uh, duty with the United States Army where I finished medical school. Then did an orthopedic uh, residency in San Antonio. Uh, served uh, the last uh, six years of my obligation at Fort Hood, Texas. Actually served in Desert Storm, you were telling me. At, for a short time. And then, uh, and then uh, did a hand fellowship at, uh, at Louisville Clown Institute. And then came to Baton Rouge in 1998, where I practiced since. And it's interesting. We were talking, uh, give the folks uh, four years of college, four years of med school, Five years of a residency training. Well, the big residency is five years. And then one year for because of your specialized Specialized in hand, in hand and upper extremity. Very interesting. And then you were the chief surgeon uh, at the largest Army base in the U.S. Right. Uh, Fort Hood, Texas, 50,000 uh, soldiers and uh, their dependents, located in central Texas. Uh, very busy place. you got a lot of experience. Worked with a lot of good orthopedists. Well-managed uh, facility and are responsible for the largest concentration of uh, American combat power in one place. Jeez, my name. So, and you, you were telling me also that you've probably done well over 10,000 surgeries? Uh, probably, yeah, if you add it up. Like, you know, try not to think of it like that. Sounds like <laughs> a lot of work. But as you say, we've been trained, and it's been a, a, a great process to get there. I tell students all the time when I go to talk to them at school, you don't jump from being a third grader to you know, doing the surgery. We have a lot of training experience to get us to that point. It's amazing. Uh, tell the folks how you decided to, to become a doctor. Well, interesting it's an story. interesting story. I tell people that uh, when I was growing up in, uh, in uh, Hammond, I lived on my great-grandparents' uh, little strawberry patch. One day I'm with my great-grandmother, and uh, she gets a little call that neighbor's uh, daughter is going to labor. And she says, come with me. I run down there with some buckets and tiles, and I'm sitting there watching uh, her help this child come in the world. And, you know, I mean, a lot of people are afraid of blood, but I was excited. So a child was born and a doctor was born. Well, huh? the, 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 <laughs> the, uh, the, the fire was kindled right there. <laughs> so, well, let's explain to folks um, the specializing in the hand surgery. What, why did you do that? What's, how Correct. does that differentiate you from uh, the typical orthopedic doctor? Correct. What happens is we all get training in that, you know, as you said, you go to medical school, four years after college. Then all physicians are required in order to have specialty training to go on to what's called residency. Uh, very much like what you see on television shows now if you watch uh, ER or uh, some of the other shows. I guess it's like on-the-job training. On, it's on-the-job training. And so I, after I hear that's in incredibly grueling. It can be. I mean, they've made, they've made some, some changes recently such that they have a more like an 80-hour work week, which is 80 hours. 80 hour, yeah, it cut it down to 80 hours. Unbelievable. But, you know, you need that kind of hands-on training in order to be able to provide care to the society at large. I mean, you can't learn it all just reading a book. So you have to be able to get that experience. And uh, in the middle of that training, uh, I was exposed to two types of procedures I found fascinating. Reconstructing complex injuries to the hand, on the job work, or people born with bad arthritis. I thought that was very interesting. And then the chance and opportunity to replant severed limbs. People cut off their thumbs or fingers. You know, that, uh, 40 years ago, that would be the end of your career. Now we have the technology and the capability to reattach those and get you back on your same life plane that you would have been on had you not been injured. That's amazing. What, uh, what takes place during the residency stage? Because I think a lot of folks think, uh, you know, a new student just gets out of med school and then he's in there doing surgery. I, I assume it's a process where you're allowed right. to do more and more. Right, exactly right. There's gradual 
uh, you're gradually doing more and more uh, procedures and getting exposed to more and more patients, supervised on a fully trained, fully certified teacher physician. Basically someone who's uh, dedicated their life to academics, pursuit of research, complex problems, and teaching uh, residents. And in fact, you, you teach or have taught in the past. I have done that in, uh, in past positions, that's correct. And uh, you are, uh, are license, have been or are currently licensed and board certified in six other states? We had been, had been yes. Uh, uh, specifically where I spent most of my time in Texas. Uh, started off in Colorado where I did my internship and then also in the state of Georgia anticipating a military move and of course here in Louisiana. Um, and so what happens you get gradually exposed to more and more uh, complex procedures as your training uh, process uh, is, is coming towards its end until by the time you're in your last year you're, you're pretty much functioning almost as you will when you graduate, but still under supervision. Let's explain to the folks um, what an orthopedic physician is compared to a general practitioner Correct. or a neurosurgeon Correct. or a neurologist. Well, ortho orthopedics, the word itself, comes from the Latin to make uh, def uh, a child's deformity straight. So that's what we do. We basically take deformities and injuries of the bones, the joints, the muscles, the tendons, and the ligaments, and we correct them you know, through surgery or medical treatment or the use of devices. And so that may, that, that's our specialty, and that's why you would come to an orthopedic surgeon, or that's why you would seek that. So if you have problems of the bones and joints, the ligaments and tendons, sports injuries, uh, injuries on the job, or if you have pain or numbness and tingling in the, in the extremity parts, those are things that you come to an orthopedic, orthopedic surgeon for. Let's talk about how, because of technology, the practice of medicine is changing so fast. I know we have, because of the computers, Right. Uh, a whole different type of testing system or diagnostic system. Correct. Explain correct. that to the folks. Correct. Well, uh, you can just look at, say, in the, in the, in the lifetime of a typical 35-year-old uh, or 40-year-old person here in Baton Rouge. We've had an onset of ability to diagnose things we could never see before with imaging through MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, uh, through uh, CAT scans, uh, which are computerized ways to look at the body. Then with the advent of arthroscopy, uh, in the 60s and 70s, we can look inside with small incisions and treat things that we used to make 12 inch incisions for when I was first starting my training. So uh, those are two Truly of the amazing. major major technical advances. And lastly, in my field, hand surgery, with the advances in optics and microscopes, we can now repair vessels that are really the size of the human hair so that Good extremity gosh. parts can survive. So all those things now we bring to the forefront to here in the South Louisiana community through our training and experience. And, and we have all of that technology here. We have that right here. I mean, it's not something you have to read about or think you got to go to Mayo Clinic or you got to travel to China. Uh, you know, all that expertise is right here in our community. So, so the MRIs and CT scans are really a way to look inside the body without having to cut the body exactly. open. Exactly. And you can get a, and then you, it, it's basically, I tell my children, it's basically as if you're going to travel somewhere and you want to figure out where you have to go. You need the best road map you can get, and that's what they do, without having to walk the ground or having been there before and without doing a lot of damage. So it allows us to, it saves time, it saves money, but most importantly, it allows you to get results without as much, without, uh, as much uh, um, I guess secondary problems. Huh? Right. And so we get better results with less damage. So you know where you're going because you've already seen the area. You know that's where you're going. You know what you get you're in mean, there. You know, as a as a person in the military, 20 years. I mean, it's the kind of intelligence a combat commander wants to have before he goes to war. Makes sense. We have that. So. And then then the orthoscopic component of the technology has allowed you actually to enter the body, uh, and do procedures that before would have required huge lacerations so you could get in, I guess, with your hands and clumsy Correct, and actually we could actually see more with the objects than you could with the naked eye because you can get around corners, so you do a better diagnostic job, you can do a better treatment job, and it allows us to give the person a better chance for recovery without complications. And I guess, it, does it have the capacity to magnify the area that you're looking it at? It does. It does magnify it quite a bit. That's amazing. Well, let's continue to talk about uh, technology and the way it's affected the practice on our next segment. This is Locke Meredith with Legal Lines and Dr. Daryl Peterson. We'll be right back. There's something you should know about me. I'm not easy to live with. In fact, I, I have a really you. ugly side. I don't always let, I you, don't speak always let you, you speak when you want. I can leave you feeling shaken and confused. And if you ignore me, I might lash out, leaving you dead. I am a stroke. Learn to recognize a stroke and act quickly. Time lost is brain lost. 
Welcome back to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith, and again, very pleased to have on the show today Dr. Daryl Peterson. He's an orthopedic surgeon here in Baton Rouge. Daryl, again, thanks for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. We were talking about uh, the way technology has changed the practice of medicine, and, and you were giving the examples of how you can look inside the body without having to cut right. it open, right. how the arthroscopic devices allow you to go in without having to create huge lacerations and use smaller tools. Let's talk about the tools or technology that's now available to actually repair the damaged areas. Correct. Well, you, you touched on it uh, with the uh, ability to look inside with the optics and the, and the instrumentation with arthroscopy, then tools had to be designed to allow you to work through those same small incisions. So those are one thing. Those tools allow us to do work that, uh, again, you, had, you couldn't do without making large incisions, which is better for the patient in terms of healing because there's less damage to get to that sure. point. Uh, second, we have improved optics in our area, for instance, allow us to work under microscope and do things we could never do before 30 years ago, repair vessels as small as, uh, you know, two human hairs. I can't even comprehend Repair nerves that, that uh, you know, people couldn't think about doing before. I mean, when we how, would, how do you do that? I mean, well, you, you know, like I said, I tell. Is it like are you sewing? You are you are sewing under under magnification that uh, we didn't have 40 years ago, and indeed, you know, it was only in the 60s that this technique actually came into the world. I, I can't even understand how you can move your hand small enough to. Oh, you your, uh, and, and it, uh, it takes training. You know, it takes training, and but you can get that training, and that skill is available right here in our market. You know, and so that's that's important. The other thing about uh, the technology, also we have uh, we have much better medications than we had before. Uh, we allowed we that are, seems to be constantly changing. I, I know y'all have the changes. pharmaceutical guys hitting in the yeah. office every Co probably every cost, day. Constantly changing, stuff. and then we know the materials have gotten stronger too. You know, stainless steel has been replaced by titanium, which is lighter, smaller, or uh, uh, so it's less obtrusive. So people can have plates and screws put on fractures. Uh, we have uh, application of titanium rods for large bone fractures so that in the old days, in the old days, uh, 30 years ago, you know, you may have to stay in the hospital for six to eight weeks if you had a broken bone in the thigh. Now you're in the hospital for 26 hours and you're walking on it in a week and the percentage of healing is much better and that's all because of the science of the metals and the science of, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, of healing that we've learned through experimentation and through research. It's, a, it's amazing. What about the prosthetics and, and re hip replacements and right, knee right. Again, replacements? Again, that's all something that was popularized, came into the forefront in the 60s, started to be done in the United States in the 70s. The materials now, uh, a lot of people fear that if you have a hip or knee replacement, it's going to wear down in a few years. No. The materials uh, have become so good in the engineering and, and the science of it has developed so much in the 80s and 90s that now they're lasting 15 to 20 years. And so someone in their 60s or 70s may be looking at just one time having these operations and going back to uh, a, a great lifestyle without pain. So, uh, so the effect of uh, science and technology really has made an uh, impact on what we and can and cannot do. And I assume it's continuing to just increase and, and become Which is better. important for us. We have to do continuing me medical education just to keep up with the advances. And so you want to come to a physician like, uh, uh, like us who keeps up with those kind of things. You have to because you want to offer that to your customers. In our case, that's patients. Now, how, how, do, how do folks go about deciding what type of doctor they need? And then you got a ton of orthopedics. I mean, is there, is there a facility or is there some type of website that helps people choose? Correct. You can look at the, uh, you can look at the, uh, the Parish Medical Center website. Uh, obviously, you can go to your primary care doctor to see who they're comfortable they have should, relationships should with. Right. You should, and they definitely know that. Uh, or you can just research your area. For instance, if you think you're having a hand problem, you can just look at the American uh, Society for Hand Surgery's website. Or you can just Google hand surgery and put in your zip code, and all people's names will come up. So it's a lot of uh, uh, the information age allows patients to make informed decisions, too, without wasting time. You can skip a step. Say, if you know you have a hand problem or upper extremity problem, you can come straight to me without having to go and make that appointment with your primary care doctor. So those are uh, advantages that didn't exist before. Now, I know it, it seems like the practice of law has changed a lot, and I know it's changed a whole lot for medicine. Um, the relationship between the doctors and the hospitals and the doctors and themselves. Uh, as I understand it, most doctors now have to practice together in some that's, form or group. That's, that's correct. Most, uh, most physicians, especially most orthopedics and hand surgeons are in groups. And the advantages of that are you give your patients um, 
the chance to have coverage all the time. Because everyone kind of seems to special, frankly we do in the law too, you specialize in different areas. Some guys are doing knees, some correct, shoulders, correct. some hands. So for instance in my group I have uh, two hand surgeons and today hand surgery means fingertip to shoulder. So it includes with, doing arthroscopic it, it surgery It includes on the arthroscopic shoulder. surgery, shoulder, wrist, it includes all the nerve work, the replantation, the, the complex fractures and the, the deformities from long-standing arthritis. I have a total joint specialist because all those advantages for replacing arthritis as our population ages, you got to offer that. I assume people. that procedure has occurred a lot more frequently now. It's occurring more and more frequently, and but because there's more and more people in the population. But again, for the, the sciences and the metal, uh, the metal uh, characteristics, the prosthesis are lasting much longer. So Which is a blessing. It is a blessing. Yeah. Uh, Explain the relationship between doctors and hospitals. I know here Correct. in Baton Rouge, we've got several different hospitals. How does that work? Well, basically, uh, in the United States today, you have basically two types of, of hospitals. You have the large uh, hospitals who have an emergency room and intensive care unit that basically service everyone. And almost all physicians and surgeons will be members of that hospital staff. So what would that hospital be here in Baton Rouge? Well, you have, there, are three, there are three large ones. There's uh, a hospital formerly known as Summit, now known as Ocean Medical Center, very near your office. There's a Lady Lake Hospital, and then there's the Baton Rouge General, two campuses. Okay. Those are in this parish, and then of course Lane in the northern part of the parish. Right. Then there are, there, are, there are what's known as surgical hospitals, which are hospitals that primarily focus on surgery either in many areas or one. Three examples here are our hospital, the Greater Baton Rouge Surgical Hospital on Hardin Boulevard. There's Surgical Specialist Center on Blue Bonnet, and then there's a Newer Medical Center also on Blue Bonnet, just a little bit closer to the mall. And as I understand it, those, those latter out, kind of outpatient surgical hospitals are actually developed uh, when uh, the doctors who were using the hospital facilities were asking the hospitals to reduce costs or help them reduce the expenses of, associated with the procedure, and the hospitals wouldn't go for it, and those guys... All you guys went out and kind of opened up your own spots. Right. You touched on two of the complex issues, which were the, the basic sum is that attempt to become full partners. And that included patient care issues and included financial issues and included cost savings, time, and also the way you practice. So once we couldn't make those agreements, then that led to the, uh, to the industry being born. And uh, we, we like to tell people that you have an alternative. We are leaner. And meaner. And meaner disease and deformity fighting machine. <laughs> That's where we are. You get, so, get the job done and get it over with. But in our society, there's a place for both of them. We should coexist, and we think that with time, that's what's going to happen in this market. Very interesting. Uh, explain to the folks uh, how the whole Katrina Rita catastrophe that we experienced here in Louisiana affected the practice of medicine. Well, first off, uh, you know, here in Baton Rouge, just like everything else, there were more people, a large influx of people over a short period of time, putting more demand on the entire health services arena. Uh, secondly, demand has stayed uh, fairly high. I mean, I don't know the official statistics, but I've for our practice, folks for our practice, at least one out of every three new people are people that before Katrina did not live in the Baton Rouge area. And, uh, and then, of course, there was an influx of people who were without health insurance, which is a real challenge because you're trying to take care of people who, don't, who before were using the charity system, and the charity system isn't, isn't working right now. So it, it put a demand both in overall numbers and in how you could get access for people in terms of care. Well, let's continue uh, on the next segment, talk about the effect of Katrina on the practice and other factors that are affecting the practice of medicine. This is Locke Meredith with Legal Lines and Dr. Daryl Peterson. We'll be right back. Come on, David. Come on, David. Let's go, David. Come on. Come on, David. You got the line. Get as involved in your kids' education as in everything they do, and imagine the success they might find. Stay in touch with the teacher. Visit the school. For more tips, call 1-800-281-1313. Welcome back to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith. Again, pleased to have on the show today Dr. Daryl Peterson, an orthopedic surgeon here in Baton Rouge. Daryl, we were talking about uh, the effect of Katrina and the basically you had an influx of a lot of people who needed help immediately. And then we still, from what I hear, have around 100,000 folks here who are really straining the system. Talk about what you, you and your medical professional partners did uh, in the beginning when Katrina sent so many folks Well, here. correct. Uh, my, uh, myself and uh, my assistants, we, of course, we volunteered and worked in uh, 
in uh, the, uh, the PMAC where we had uh, patients. I was on duty and we'd bring patients with orthopedic problems to the general hospitals and take care of them. Uh, we made our numbers available to the temporary shelters set up, uh, uh, certainly near where the temporary housing were. We continue to maintain relationship with those agencies over time. Um, and uh, one of the biggest things that we did in our practice, we went actually out and actually recruited another orthopedic surgeon into our group to help, to help take care of the man, another hand surgeon, uh, Dr. Siobhan LeBrown, who's part of our practice. And uh, I joined a larger group of five people to deliver more care. Uh, As so, I understand it, uh, that kind of, you know, and there were a lot of docs and a lot of healthcare professionals that helped deal with the crisis, but we still kind of have a crisis because I've had Dr. Bill Cassidy on, who's now a right. state senator, and you said it, the, the charity system is broke. And we have so many folks who are uninsured or underinsured. What are we going to do? You know, I mean, it's an interesting uh, concept. Obviously, if I had all the answers, you know, you'd know my name and I'd be famous. But I think that the one thing we have to do in our state is we have to decide, and I hope we make the decision on the positive uh, aspect for patients, where we're going to want the patients to come. Do we utilize existing facilities and expand them? You know, maybe perhaps building a university hospital here that serves everyone, not just indigent. Right. But everyone wants to go there because it provides all those Quality modern things that we said we can give. Quality of care. Not indigent versus non-indigent, not poor versus uh, payer, but quality care where you and I want to go and send our mother and our children, but everyone can go and get those services. A mixture between the training programs and private practice. If we could do that in this state, we would really be serving our patients. And I guess it boils down to money. Well, then you know, it always boils down to money, but you know what it boils down to? Leadership and decision, just like fighting a war and being in the Army 20 years. Once the leadership makes the decision and implements a plan, the money will follow. And, and as I understand it, uh, Dr. Cassie has asked you to, to head up or participate he's in some of He's asked me to the... participate in some of the things he's doing. I'm already on one task force with him, and we have great hopes he's going to do a good job. I know his heart's in it. Correct. He's lived and breathed it. Let's talk about the other things that have really changed the practice of medicine for doctors in, in the, the last, I don't know, 10, 20 years. The first one that comes to my head is health insurance. We have folks say... I can't afford health insurance, and I believe it. It's unbelievably the expensive. The prices of health insurance, even just in the last three years, have gone up over 15 percent. It's crazy. And a lot of people think that that 15 percent increase goes to you guys. Goes to us. <laughs> Let me tell you, it doesn't. We have negotiated contracts. We still give the same quality of care, but the actual amount of reimbursement we get goes down over a five-year period. I mean, you can talk to some orthopedists that have been here 30, 20, 30 years. They're getting paid 50, 60 percent less for the same operation that they did 20 years ago. So it's not us. It's crazy. So, so some kind of way in the way things are processed or the cost of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of technology or whatever, we have to find a way to not pass it on to the customer or to control it. Well, let's talk about this because as I understand it, uh, doctors have to negotiate with the health insurance companies uh, as to the type of fee that they're going to charge for the various procedures. That's correct. And y'all negotiate that, what, regularly? Oh, probably at least every other year. And, of course, unlike other industries, we have the government, which helps set some prices because with Medicare and Medicaid, probably in the United States today, the federal government is one of the biggest payers. So everyone is set on the prices that they make. But we don't, but we don't really, you know, I don't want people to think that we spend a lot of time doing that. We have managers who do that also because to give a good quality product, we can't go out of business because we become broke. So we have to, you know, do some business activity that makes us not. Uh, go out of business because we don't bring in enough cash to keep open. We can't take care of you if we're closed. Well, and you throw workers' comp I I into the mix, which also uh, is the law that governs injuries to folks who are injured on the job. Correct. And they also predetermine uh, the amount that's paid for that's correct. different types of care. So you've got the health insurance companies telling uh, doctors what they can charge, the federal government telling doctors what they can charge if the patients using uh, federal funds, Correct. and then you got the, uh, the workers' comp insurers telling doctors what they can charge. So you guys are really limited, and as I understand it, you're, from what you're saying, your income actually has gone down. The some. actual amount of, uh, of, um, like per patient. of per, per procedure and per diagnosis to treatment, the actual amount of reimbursement you get goes down over time instead of going up. So you guys are having to handle more patients, I guess, quicker just to keep your head above water? Well, you can't really go much quicker. I mean, you know, people take the same amount of time for the same problem. You want to give everybody, if, you, if it takes you five to ten minutes to give me your story, for me to examine you and to diagnose you, you still get that time. You know, so I just work later sometimes. But the one thing I'd always tell people about health insurance, you know, this is graduation time here in South Louisiana. 
two great colleges, kids are going to graduate and go on to great jobs. If, instead of buying your kids a great car and sending them to Europe for vacation, make sure that you keep the health insurance going for them between the time they get out of your plan because they're graduating and the time their next job, next job kicks in on their insurance. We see lots of kids in June, July, August, September before their job pays insurance right. get injured and they run up $50,000 bills and they had no insurance because they were in that gap. Well, and I know that a lot of universities provide health insurance. You can purchase health insurance for the students that go there. You can. So your recommendation is absolutely Absolutely. Get as, a, as, a, as that parent, that grandparent, that God, that Pa Ran and Nan Nan, instead of helping to get that car, make sure that that insurance, that you pay their insurance after they graduate. We see that and it's tragic in the summertime. Um, let's talk about, because there's the perception that the health insurance companies basically tell the doctors what tests they have to do and what tests they cannot uh, perform, uh, that they're really involved in the practice of medicine. Is that right or wrong? Well, that's what it means by managed care. They managed some of the, they managed certain aspects of the care. And so you do have to you have to go through the company to get certification or approval to do these tests. They do uh, negotiate with you on what tests. They make you give them the criteria. And in many times, it just makes us step up our level of uh, diagnostic uh, capability because we have to order the right test at the right time. So, but with years, you've learned. So is learned, it a bad thing or a good thing? It's good in, some, in most ways. I think it's actually good because it does keep the health care costs down. Overall, it is. But it becomes bad if they don't allow a person to get the treatment they need or they delay it long. That's when it becomes bad. I understand. Tell folks uh, as a patient when they come to you, who makes the best patient? The best patient is a person who can articulate their problem, who's willing to go through the recommendations that you give, and who will be compliant. The worst patient is one who says, give me the best treatment you can, but I don't want surgery. <laughs> Daryl, thank you so much for being on the show. We appreciate it. Thank you. It. This is Locke Meredith and Legal Lines with Dr. Daryl Peterson. Thank you for being with us.